Good morning and welcome back. Here's what we're focusing on this half hour on your Friday. Mechanical systems at Seattle's West Point treatment plant now restored, as you may have heard, but a just published investigation shows a cascade of errors led to the catastrophe and it was only sheer luck that spared workers' lives. An exclusive interview with a reporter breaking this story straight ahead. May Day used to herald the beginning of spring with flowers, maples, and baskets. So how did it become a day of protest? The backstory you may not have heard next. The top woman at Facebook sharing what she learned after her husband's sudden death, how her resiliency is inspiring others to find their own. And Tyler is streaming the show behind the scenes live on Facebook right now. You have a great question. It has to do with parenting. What That's is right. It? They should probably be involved in their kids' lives, in school, and in sports, but where do we draw the line? When does a parent become too involved? Give us your stories. We'll read some of them uh, coming up later in the show. Can't wait to get very those. much. But first, in less than a month, the mayor's race here in Seattle went from sure thing for an Ed Murray re-election to a hot and heated multiple candidate race and a damaged incumbent. It all happened like just like that. And some of the top issues that have emerged in recent days include a push for a city income tax by former Mayor Mike McGinn, a new tax on sugary drinks being championed by Mayor Ed Murray, the looming questions surrounding the fate of Key Arena versus the possibility of a Soto Arena. And then hanging over all of it, there is the sex abuse allegations made by underage teens against Mayor Murray, which of course he has vehemently denied and vowed to continue fighting. There is a lot we need to take a step back here. We literally <laughs> stepped back from the anchor desk to the couch because Brandy is here. Help us sort this out. Wh who's in the race and who's not in the race? Well, I love this because I love a, a good heated race. Um, and there's a lot of people. I think a couple ones to focus on. Obviously, Ed Murray. We know about him, the incumbent, some of the issues he's facing. Mike McGinn, uh, which is such a, a weird thing. I feel like somebody transporting me back in time, our previous mayor, uh, who, of course, lost his bid for re-election against Ed Murray. So you're looking at the potential for a very similar face-off. Um, some other people, I think, that have come out in recent weeks that are of note. Carrie Moon, uh, she really came to the forefront when she was a really diehard opponent against the Highway 99 tunnel, which we know ended up having a ton of issues, but Bertha has made its way through. And then Nikita Oliver is someone who I think has been picking up steam on social media. Macklemore uh, endorsed her. She's a BLM, Black Lives Matter activist. She's been uh, active in the fight against having a new youth jail. She's an artist. She's a teacher. Uh, so she sort of seems to have this younger crowd and some excitement definitely growing behind her. A couple of questions on that. Is this the last that we're going to hear or is the list going to continue growing? And who who do you think is, is a truly viable candidate from this list? Sure. So keep in mind, there's more than those four. I just, mm -hmm. for, for time's sake, wanted to list off some of the ones that are more relevant. Um, they have until May 19th. And I wouldn't doubt it if some other people decided to jump in uh, before that time. You know, I think that all the four people I mentioned are viable candidates. And the reality with all of these things surrounding Mayor Ed Murray, I mean, a couple months ago, I was literally on the air. We were talking about a tax he wanted to do. And I said, well, it doesn't matter if it's not politically, um, you know, that people like it because he's going to win re-election anyway, and then all of a sudden all this stuff happened. So I think with these accusation, accusations against Ed Murray, it has really opened up the, the floor for so many people who otherwise would not have been viable candidates. If you didn't have these accusations against the mayor and you still had these same candidates against him, I, I would have said, well, he's still going to win re-election. And now with that sort of cloud, I think that it's possible that any of these people could at least get up there in the primary. This race, I feel like more than other me recent mayoral elections means something to people who even live outside of Seattle yeah. in, a, in a more important way. Would you explain that? Well, and also, I think, for a lot of reasons. I mean, I don't know what reason you're thinking of, but, you know, Seattle, when it comes to politics and how we deal with things, it influences a lot of what other cities in the region and across the country decide to do. I mean, think about the things that Seattle has done in battling against the Trump administration. Uh, that's certainly something that would continue uh, regardless, I think, of who's elected. We're not going to re elect a Republican for <laughs> no. mayor in Seattle. No. Uh, you know, we're at the forefront of a lot of things, of policing, um, and, and certainly some of the ways that we choose to solve problems like, um, you know, growing cost of housing, livability, affordability, traffic, congestion, those are all things that other cities are impacted by and that other cities tend to be able to model their practices and policies after. And it's so interesting how quickly it went from, as you mentioned, like he's probably going to win even if others run against I him. I literally too. said no, that on the I air and then two <laughs> weeks later that, that bombshell dropped and that's going to continue to be an issue yeah. for him. It's going to continue to be a problem. We'll stay on top of it. We'll keep checking back in with you. Brandy, yeah. thank you. Appreciate it. Well, Monday, as you may know, marks May 1st, and over the last decade or so, that has meant street demonstrations in support of immigration reform and labor rights, protests that have occasionally been hijacked by anonymous anarchists who use the day to vandalize property and cause mayhem. But somewhere back in our memories, we also remember May Day involving flowers, baskets, 
and kind deeds for neighbors. So we dug into the history of May 1st. Now, initially, the holiday seems to evolve from a European tradition dating back hundreds of years of celebrating the beginning of spring. That's where the association with flowers, festivals, and those kind deeds stems from. Along the way, people often often kids, began dancing around maypoles and filling baskets with flowers and goodies and then ringing the doorbell and anonymously leaving them on a neighbor's doorstep. But all of that changed. May 1st, 1886, that was the first day of a three-day official labor strike in Chicago. The strike was in support of an eight-hour workday, but ultimately ended in riots and a bomb blast. Seven police officers were killed. Several striking workers were as well. 200 people injured. Three years later, the International Socialist Conference declared May 1st International Workers' Day to commemorate what we now know as the Haymarket Affair from our history books. But here's where things get interesting. During the Cold War, that day fell out of favor because of the association with socialism and communism. And President Eisenhower even declared May 1st on the calendar Loyalty Day. But then once the Cold War ended, the day has begun slowly to resume its significance as a day of action related to labor, workers' rights, and immigration. Travis, we talked about this earlier, just the historical significance that we weren't even really aware of at the time it was happening. I mean, maybe that was our age, I'm not sure, but to even discover that there was a time that we didn't want to associate it with it at all was really interesting. Really interesting. And then why in the last 10 years we've seen this reemergence of the labor activism and then the addition of the immigration activism. It's because the Cold War threat had, had basically ended. And we just hope that this Monday everything can stay peaceful yeah. as it should. So we appreciate that. Well, we've seen retail stores around here closing at an alarming rate. We've really been keeping on top of this in this show. It's a trend happening all over the country, but, but why? Why is this happening? Well, take a look at this report in the Atlantic. There have been 10 retail bankruptcies in 2017 so far. 10, and we're barely five months in. As a comparison, we had nine in all of 2016. We like to think it's because of Amazon. That's an easy thing to blame, but that's only a part of it. Yes, people are buying more stuff online. In fact, look at this. In 2010, Amazon sales were 16 billion, and in 2016, that number grew to 80 billion. Compare that to Sears revenue last year, just $22 billion. But here's another reason. America simply built too many malls. There are 1,200 malls in America today. Experts estimate that number could go down to 900 over the next decade. That's because visits to the mall declined by 50% just between the years 2010 and 2013. So Americans are shifting their spending from material things like clothes and electronics to experiences, meals out with their friends, things like that. Since 2005, sales at restaurants and bars have grown twice as fast as all other retail spending. Take a look at this graph on your screen here. In 2016, for the first time ever, Americans spent more money in restaurants and bars then in grocery stores, again, I think people are starting to realize the value of experience yeah. over material things. It's the combination of the online retailer success and the experiential uh, living and spending your money doing that. Do you think it's also the experience of buying something online is satisfactory enough that it's not necessarily the acquiring of it? It's the, I found something and now it's going to be delivered to my door. It yeah. kind of relates a little bit to experience. I, yeah, I definitely think so. used to think that, oh, it's so much easier to buy and maybe people would buy more. But actually, I feel like I really buy online what I need yeah. versus going into the store where I'm like, oh, I could use that and maybe I could use one of those. Feels like you're getting away with something. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is already the number one best-selling book on Amazon just four days after being released and it covers a topic that touches every single one of us even as we have no clue how to talk about it. We're talking about grief. The book is called Option B. It is the new book by the Facebook Chief Operating Officer Sheryl Sandberg and while her first book encouraged women to lean into the workforce, Option B actually encourages all of us to learn more about grief and, and really it's about embracing, finding a way through grief, not out of it, no. but but with it. Staying with it. Yeah. Cheryl's husband, Dave Goldberg, was just 47 years old when he died suddenly during their 2015 vacation. And the grief she and their two kids struggled through in those first few months, grief that they still carry with them today, compelled her to write Option B to help others. When I lost Dave, I had all the grief, but I also felt increasingly isolated because people were afraid to talk about it. They kind of looked at me like I was a deer in the headlights. All the easy interactions I used to have, dropping my kids at school, coming into the office, were gone. And so grief led to isolation, led to more grief, led to more isolation. And part of what I hope Option B does is kick those elephants out of the room so we can start talking to each other. 
I love what she is doing. Sandberg wrote option B along with her friend, psychologist Adam Grant. He's who actually t she turned to in those first couple of weeks um, to ask, how do I get through this? And how do I get my kids through this? Mm -hmm. And what Adam said to me is that the sadness never goes away entirely, and of course it doesn't. I miss him every day. But that there were steps I could take to help my kids and myself recover. Option B is our attempt to share what we learned from people who have studied this for a really long time, but also just amazing people that have faced all forms of adversity. More and more celebrities and public figures like Sheryl Sandberg are recognizing the value of being open about grief. Last week we told you about Prince William and Prince Harry opening up about the grief, uh, you know, that they'd suppressed for years mm -hmm. after their mom died. Princess Diana, she was killed in a car accident in 1997. So it is... It, it matters when people stand up and say, this is what grief looks like, and this is why how I feel about it, because others feel so alone. She said it, how isolating grief can feel. And we went out and bought this book the minute we saw that it was available, because we've both been through so much grief, you in particular, in the last couple of years, and I think it's there's such an isolation to it. And to hear someone like Sheryl Sandberg acknowledge that and say, I felt isolated too. I mean, I, I look up to her as someone yeah. for whom nothing impacts nearly as badly as it must me, and maybe I'm weak for not dealing with it correctly. I really like even just the title of the book, Option B. She mm -hmm. says it came from this conversation she had with a friend where she was like, I want to, I want Dave, her husband, to be at this family event or this event. And he said, Option A isn't available. Let's kick the heck out of Option B. And we all live option B. Yes. You don't make it out of this life without grief and loss. We all live option B. So let's figure out how to be resilient about doing it. And the more we can talk about it, the easier it will be for all of us. We That's can right. kind of be in it together. Oh, yeah. Parents, speaking of, we know that you can get a little bit intense when it comes to the sidelines of your little kid, <laughs> your kids' games, baseball, soccer, football. Oh, though, but there is one little league tackling all of this. Mm, overbearing parenting on social media this week. If we're not pointing any fingers, maybe you or maybe it's just someone you know questions the ump, yells throughout the entire game, more hustle. Well, there's here's one Wisconsin Little League solution. Chill out. They've posted this sign on their field. It says, remember, these are kids. This is a game. Coaches are volunteers. Ump here, umpires are human. And our favorite, your kid is not being scouted by the Brewers or the Mariners, or whoever. <laughs> or anyone, <laughs> or for that matter. <laughs> the sign was actually posted a while back by the Glendale Little League, but someone posted it to Reddit this week. That's why it's now going viral. And a lot of parents obviously can react to this, which is why, Tyler, we're asking folks their opinions about the overbearing sports parents. That's right. Tons of people are sounding off, so thanks for joining us on our Facebook Live. Judy says, I do believe parents can be too involved. We need to make sure our children are being treated fairly, but we don't want to mother them too much because then they can't problem solve for themselves. So head to our Facebook Live and join, uh, leave some more comments. We'll read them later on on in the show. Awesome. Yes, please do. Please, please, please. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks, Tyler. Uh, so coming up next, more of your answers and our news partner, The Seattle Times, digging into 7,000 documents, interviewing countless people involved in a disaster at our wastewater treatment plant. What they found was a series of avoidable errors in a situation that nearly cost lives. We're talking exclusively with a reporter breaking this investigation before it's even in the print edition. She's joining us next. Good morning and welcome back. After nearly two months of repairs, the West Point treatment plant in North Seattle finally back to full operations. Yeah, back in February, remember this? Heavy rains flooding the treatment plant, shutting down critical systems, causing untreated sewage to pour into Puget Sound. Now, officials said they were able to repair enough of the systems to run the plant at a limited capacity, but yesterday was when they reported all equipment is now up and running. The next step is to make sure the repaired equipment is stable so that nothing like this happens again. But just this morning, the Seattle Times publishing a huge investigation into how all of this happened on its website uh, and is going to be the front page of the Sunday edition of the newspaper. Reporter uh, Linda V. Mapes is here. You're helping us preview this story. You're the investigative reporter on all of this. You dug through 7,000 documents, interviewed wow. countless people. Can you give us kind of the high level? It sounds like a series of errors here. Sure. Good morning. Thanks for having me on the show. And I did this with my colleague, Christine Wilmson at the paper, and all my other colleagues throughout the newsroom. This was a big team effort, and we were at it for weeks and weeks and weeks. And, you know, what we found was surprising to us in, in the sense that it was really a very simple device, a float switch, no more complicated than what's at the back of your toilet, costs about $200. 
That was one of the key problems in this disaster. There were eight of them. They had been installed in 1996, and they had been causing problems at this plant time and time and time again, dating back at least to 2000, and very similar problems to what happened on the night of February 9th, sticking jamming, not functioning, such that this critical piece of equipment that is supposed to protect the plant from flooding failed. And workers, operators at the plant were counting on it to work. And when it didn't, the plant flooded with some 15 million gallons of untreated wastewater. But that was just one of the things that went wrong that night. Communication was just in an absolute state of breakdown. Workers who were trying to manage this disaster thought that the operator in the control room knew the flooding was happening. They actually did not tell him. Oh so he doesn't even know this is going on until they finally stumble and, and race back to the control room after this flood has been going on for about a half an hour. And by that time, it's way too late. And so the communication breakdown was intense. There's a training issue here too. I mean, this. This mantra of do not bypass, and what I mean by that of don't open the emergency gate to literally bypass untreated waste to Puget Sound, that's there to protect the environment and that is important, but it is not the only value. We also have the region's largest critical piece of infrastructure at stake. I mean, we cannot live here in a city next to Puget Sound without functioning wastewater treatment. And this is the largest plant in the region, the largest of its type on the West Coast. And to lose the plant like this for so many months, you know, we're talking about February 9th until yesterday, the 27th of April. It's a long time. That winds up doing a lot more environmental damage than, an, you know, a, a brief one-time bypass. And so there's a culture around this that needs to shift. And these workers need to be supported to make that decision in the moment. And, in, and right now, you know, they're fined, they're criticized, they're questioned, they're grilled. And, and not only that, but let's ask ourselves, so why didn't anybody re replace this switch a long time ago? Fix the toilet. Yeah. Fix the darn thing. Well, you know, <laughs> this, this again is this culture of, you know, make it last, make it work, be thrifty, be you know, um, ingenious about working with what you've got. And, and that's very admirable. But man, oh, man, to cause an estimated $25 million in damage because of this, like, $200 piece of equipment is just really hard to face. So, you know, I, I feel for the workers. They're um, deeply committed to clean water. That's why they're in this industry. Well, you say it's sheer luck that no one was hurt or killed. Boy, that is, is that true. That is really terrifying. I was over at the plant yesterday. They gave a tour and I want to get back to that. But there's this slot in the in the in the on the floor that is covered with a, a cover that had been forced off by the force of the flood. It is a 16 foot deep tank and this Operator and trainee, she'd only been on the job for a little more than a month, falls in this tank because, of course, it's covered with this brown rushing water. She doesn't oh even know goodness. there's a hole she's about to fall into. And she sort of catches herself, and one of her colleagues helps her up and away. But, I mean, she's in shock. She's injured, and it could have been so much more serious. I imagine scenes from Titanic the movie, I mean, honestly, without over-exaggerating. I know, and there are tunnels um, that were flooded all the way to the ceiling, 12 feet high. And if there had been people in those tunnels, there's no question that we would have lost lives. And so this was a very, very serious event and could have been so much worse. And so we just really um, hope that people will pay attention to the coverage and um, take very seriously this plant that we have to um, protect, take care of, and value because it is, it is why we can live here. So you were there yesterday, lots of media. Did you see changes being made? Yes. there is. There have been a lot of things done since that flood. Cleaning, replacement, repair, really a heroic effort to get this very large, very complicated plant back on its feet. But I want to be clear that this is a limited recovery at this point. There are two issues in wastewater treatment. One is mechanical, lots and lots of different pumps and motors and processes and systems. The other is biological. This is secondary treatment, and these are actually microbes that eat the material that's left in the water after all that mechanical process. It's a little bit like you after you've come back from an illness. Do you instantly start eating the big hero sandwich, the double cheeseburger? No. No. I have, and it's not <laughs> right. It's not right. right. No, you're, you're on the clear chicken broth for a while. Yeah. Well, that's what's going on with these microbes. They're not ready to take the full load at this point. 
so the, these so-called digesters that are the last step in the chain, which reduce the amount of solids and purify them, they can only take about half the action right now. And so what are we doing with all the rest of that material, which by the way is still going there every day, hour after hour. If you live in Seattle, all the way up to Lake Forest Park, down to Duwamish, that's where it's going. And we don't even think about this. We flush the toilet, we send stuff down the sink, and we just, you know, walk away. Well, there are people who have to deal with all that. And there's a plant that we built 50 years ago that's been taking care of it for us. But right now it is still not back all the way to action because these microbes can't quite get it done yet, but they are recovering. So right now, half that waste is being handled in the usual way, but the other half still has to go somewhere. So we are spending between $700 and $1,100 a load to truck it on tanker trucks. This is sludge wow. yeah. through Magnolia uh. all the way to Renton, where the South Plant is treating it, but we can't even manage it only with trucks. There's so much sludge that has to be processed. So what's left over that the digesters can't handle, that we can't get enough trucks to even manage, is going into Puget Sound. So we still are not meeting permit. There is a state water quality permit that requires the water to be a certain level of clean when it is discharged to the sound. And, it, and we are not there yet. We won't be there for weeks. And that's if everything continues to progress in a good way with these microbes. So root for those bugs. Yeah. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> well, this this is clearly just the tipping point. We encourage everyone to read more about this investigation. Again, it's online right now, seattletimes.com. It's going to be the front page of the print edition on Sunday. We're going to keep you here and tape an extra interview. I'm just going to be transparent about that, that you can watch this weekend on Q13 News this morning, Saturday and Sunday, so that we can get a little bit more into this, because I imagine there are a lot of people with questions. Lots of questions. Thank, Thank you, you so Linda. much, Linda. Thank you. So coming up next, we're going to read more of your Facebook answers. Uh, to the, And we're also going to look at this totally legit note, remember this, <laughs> that the school sent home to a mom in Utah that went, wildly viral about her son playing video games. We're going to hear from the mom and the son next. And take a look at your screen for our Friday trivia. We're going to reveal the answer on the other side of the break. So here's the Friday trivia, and it's all about naming your dog and food, and the answer is... Oh, Oreo. Uh, I, I guess muffin. I guess olive. <laughs> <laughs> Tyler got it right. Come on, Tyler. So we ask you about kids and Little League games and the signs popping up as, as teachers and coaches try to take these ser parents just don't Seriously? take it so seriously. <laughs> so serious. What are people saying? Yeah, so we're getting lots of great comments on both sides, but several people told us that we have signs like that in our area. So let's take a look at a couple of them. We've got pictures. One was sent in from Auburn, and it says, please remember, these are kids. This is a game. The coaches are volunteers. A great message. And we also have a second one. Uh, this is from Richland, so the Tri-Cities area. Be a good sport. I just hope that people are actually reading these signs, yeah. the people that need to see it. Yes. <laughs> Except the decisions of game yeah. officials. Accept them now. <laughs> Tyler, thank you so thank much. You we want to start your weekend on a pretty fun note. So you might remember this story we shared last week about the totally legit note that Nathan wrote or the school <laughs> sent home for his mom. Yeah. It basically said, Nathan's failing video game class and he needs to be allowed to play video games all the time. That's the note, kind of suspicious. Uh, but it turns out that uh, his mom was, was um, you know, really interested in all of this. And here's what she told us. And it worked a little bit. I got to stay up 30 more uh, minutes that night. Thoughts. Yes. So he did actually get to stay up a little bit later, so it and uh, it did work a little bit. Mom wow. was very impressed. It's now gone wildly viral. Nathan and his mom are a little bit of internet celebrities. Wow, <laughs> starting them young, I like it. All right, well, have a great weekend, everyone. Remember, you can catch us here every Friday morning at 9.30 as we take a deeper dive into topics you care about most. And join us, as always, on our Facebook Live discussion on the Q13 News Facebook page. Have a good weekend.